Section 1 of the Spiritual Maxims of Brother Lawrence. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Spiritual Maxims of Brother Lawrence. Section 1 we must study ever to regard god and his glory in everything we do and say and undertake this is the end that we should set ourselves to offer to god a sacrifice of perfect worship in this life as we hope to do through all eternity we ought firmly to resolve to overcome with the grace of god assisting us the many difficulties that will meet us in the spiritual life when we enter upon the spiritual life we should consider thoroughly what we are probing to the very depths we shall find that we are altogether deserving of contempt unworthy of the name of jesus prone to all manner of maladies and subject to all kinds of infirmities which distress us and impair the soul's health rendering us wavering and unstable in our humours and dispositions in fact creatures whom it is god's will to chasten and make humble by numberless afflictions and adversities as well within as without we must believe steadfastly never once doubting that such discipline is for our good that it is god's will to visit us with chastening that it is the course of his divine providence to permit our souls to pass through all manner of sore experiences and times of trial and for the love of god undergo diverse sorrows and afflictions for so long as shall seem needful to him since without this submission of heart and spirit to the will of god devotion and perfection cannot subsist a soul is the more dependent on grace the higher the perfection to which it aspires and the grace of god is more needful for each moment as without it the soul can do nothing the world the flesh and the devil can join forces and assault the soul so straightly and untiringly that without humble reliance on the ever-present aid of god they drag the soul down in spite of all resistance thus to rely seems hard to nature but grace makes it become easy and brings with it joy end of section one section two of the spiritual maxims of brother lawrence this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Of Necessary Practices for Attaining to the Spiritual Life That practice that is alike the most holy, the most general, and the most needful is the practice of the presence of God. It is the schooling of the soul to find its joy in his divine companionship holding with him at all time and at every moment humble and loving converse without set rule or stated method in all time of our temptation and tribulation in all time of our dryness of soul and disrelish of god yes even when we fall into unfaithfulness and actual sin we should apply ourselves unceasingly to this one end to so rule all our actions that they be little acts of communion with god but they must not be studied they must come naturally from the purity and simplicity of the heart we must do all things thoroughly and soberly without impetuosity or precipitancy which denotes a mind undisciplined we must go about our labours quietly calmly and lovingly entreating him to prosper the works of our hands by thus keeping heart and mind fixed on god we shall bruise the head of the evil one and beat down his weapons to the ground when we are busied or meditating on spiritual things even in our time of set devotion whilst our voice is rising in prayer we ought to cease for one brief moment as often as we can to worship god in the depth of our being to taste him though it be in passing to touch him 
as it were by stealth, since you cannot but know that God is with you in all you undertake, that he is at the very depth and centre of your soul, why should you not pause an instant from time to time, in your outward business, and even in the act of prayer, to worship him within your soul, to praise him, to entreat his aid, to offer him the service of your heart, and to give him thanks for all his loving kindness and tender mercies. What offering is there more acceptable to God than thus throughout the day to quit the things of outward sense and to withdraw to worship him within the secret places of the soul? Besides, by so doing, we destroy the love of self, which can subsist only amongst the things of sense, and of which these times of quiet retirement with God rids us well nigh unconsciously. In very truth, we can render to God no greater or more signal proofs of our trust and faithfulness than by thus turning from things created to find our joy, though for a single moment in the Creator. Yet think not that I counsel for you to disregard completely and forever the outward things that are around us. That is impossible. Prudence, the mother of the virtues, must be your guide. Yet I am confident that it is a common error amongst religious persons to neglect this practice of ceasing for a time, that which they are engaged upon to worship God in the depth of their soul, and to enjoy the peace of brief communion with Him. This digression has been long, and yet it seemed to me the matter demanded such. These acts of worship are to be prompted and guided by faith. We must unfeignedly believe that God is in very fact within our souls and that we must worship him, and love him, and serve him in spirit, and in truth, that he sees all, and unto him all hearts are open, our own, and those of all his creatures, that he is self-existent, whilst it is in him that all his creatures live, and move, and have their being, that his perfection is infinite, and sovereign, and demands the full surrender of ourselves, our souls, and bodies. In simple justice we owe him all our thoughts and words, and actions. Let us see to it that we pay our debt. Necessity is laid upon us to examine ourselves with diligence, to find out what are the virtues that we chiefly lack, and which are the hardest for us to acquire. We should seek to learn the sins that do most easily beset us, and the times and occasions when we do most often fail. In the time of struggle we should have recourse to God, with perfect confidence, abiding steadfast in the presence of His divine majesty. In lowly adoration we should tell out before Him our griefs and our failures, asking Him lovingly for the succour of His grace. And in our weakness we shall find in Him our strength. End of section 2 Section 3 of the Spiritual Maxims of Brother Lawrence. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Of how it is required of us to worship God in spirit and in truth. There are three points in this question which must be answered. To worship God in spirit and in truth means to offer Him the worship that we owe. God is a spirit and therefore we must worship him in spirit and in truth. That is to say, by presenting to him a true and humble spiritual worship in the very depth of our being. God alone can see this worship, which, offered unceasingly, will in the end become as it were natural, and as if he was one with our soul, and our soul one with him. Practice will make this clear. To worship God in truth is to acknowledge him to be what he is, and ourselves as what in very fact we are. To worship him in truth is to acknowledge with heartfelt sincerity what in truth God is.
that is to say, infinitely perfect, worthy of infinite adoration, infinitely removed from sin, and so of all the divine attributes. That man is little guided by reason, who does not employ all his powers to render this great God the worship that is his due. Furthermore, to worship God in truth is to confess that we live our lives entirely contrary to his will, and contrary to our knowledge that, were we but willing, he would fain make us comfortable to him. Who will be guilty of such folly as to withhold, even for a moment, the reverence and the love, the service and the unceasing worship that we owe him? Of the union of the soul with God There are three degrees of union of the soul with God. The first degree is general, the second is virtual union, and the third is actual union. That degree of union as the general which one finds when the soul is united by God solely by grace. Virtual union, which is in effect union though not in fact, is our state when beginning any action by which we are united to God, we remain so united to him by reason of that action, and for such time as it lasts. Actual union is the perfect union. In the other degrees, the soul is passive, almost as if it were slumbering. In this actual union, the soul is intensively active. Quicker than fire are its operations, more luminous than the sun, and obscured by any passing cloud. Yet we can be deceived as to this union by our own feelings. It is not a mere fleeting emotion, such as would prompt a passing cry, My God, I love thee with my heart's full strength. It is rather a state of soul, if I can but find the words, which is deeply spiritual and very simple, which fills us with a joy that is calm indeed, and with a love that is very humble and very reverent which lifts the soul heights where the sense of the love of God constrains it to adore him, to embrace him, with a tenderness that cannot be expressed and experience alone can teach us to understand. All who aspire to a union with the divine should know that whatever can gladden the will is in fact pleasing to it, or at least so the will reckons it. There is no one but must avow that God is beyond understanding. To be united to him, it is needful, therefore, to deny the will all tastes and pleasures, bodily and spiritually, that being thus detached, it can be free to love God above all things. For if the will can in any measure come to know God, it can do so only through love. The difference is great between the tastes and sentiments of the will and its working. Since the will's tastes and sentiments are in the soul as in their bounds, whilst its working, which is properly love, finds its sole end in God. End of section 3「Section 4 of the Spiritual Maxims of Brother Lawrence. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. The Presence of God The presence of God is an applying of our spirit to God, or a realization of God as present, that is born home to us by either the imagination or by the understanding. I have a friend who, these forty years, has been practicing through the understanding a realization of the presence of God. To it he gives many other names. Sometimes he calls it a simple act, or a clear and distinct knowledge of God. At other times a view as through a glass, a loving gaze, an inward sense of God. Yet again he terms it waiting on God 
a silent converse with him, a repose in him, the life and peace of the soul. Still, my friend tells me that all these ways in which he has expressed his sense of the presence of God come from the same thing, and that the presence fills his soul quite naturally, that it has come so to pass in this way. He says that by unwearying efforts, by constantly recalling his mind to the presence of God, a habit has been formed within him of such a nature that, so soon as he is freed from his ordinary labour, and not seldom when he is engaged thereon, his soul lifts itself up above all earthly matters, without a care or forethought on his part and dwells as if it were firmly stayed on God, as in its centre and place of rest, faith almost always being his companion at such times. Let us mark well, however, that this intercourse with God he holds within the depth of his being, there it is that the soul speaks to God, heart to heart, and over the soul thus holding converse, there steals a great and profound peace. All that passes without concerns the soul no more than a fire of straw, which the more it flares, the sooner it burns itself out. And rarely indeed do the cares of this world ever intrude to trouble the peace that is within. But to come back to our consideration of the presence of God, you must know that the tender and loving light of God's countenance kindles insensibly within the soul, which ardently embraces it. So great and so divine a fire of love to God, that one is perforce compelled to moderate the outward expression of the feelings. Great would be our surprise if we but knew what converse the soul holds at these times with God, who seems to so delight in this communion, that to the soul which would fain ever abide with him, he bestows favours past numbering, and as if he dreaded lest the soul should turn again to the things of earth, he provides for it abundantly, so that the soul finds within faith a nourishment divine, a joy that has no measure beyond its utmost thought and desire, and this without a single effort on its part but simple consent. The presence of God is thus life and nourishment for the soul, and with the aid of His grace it can attain thereunto by diligent use of the means which I will now set out. End of section 4「Section 5 of the Spiritual Maxims of Brother Lawrence. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Of the means for attaining unto the presence of God. The first is great purity of life in guarding ourselves with care lest we should do or say or think anything which might be displeasing to God and will any such thing happens in taking heed to repent thereof, humbly begging his forgiveness. The second is great faithfulness in the practice of his presence, and in the keeping of the soul's gaze fixed on God in faith, calmly, humbly, lovingly, without allowing an entrance to anxious cares and disquietude. Make it your study before taking up any task to look to God, be it only for a moment, as also when you are engaged thereon, and lastly when you have performed the same. And for as much as without time and great patience, this practice cannot be attained. Be not disheartened at your many falls. Truly this habit can only be formed with difficulty. Yet, when it is so formed, how great will be your joy therein! Is it not right that the heart, which is the first thing in us to have life, and which has dominion over all the body, should be the first and last thing to love and worship God, both when we begin and end our actions, be they spiritual or bodily, and generally in all the affairs of life? It is here, therefore, in the habit of this gaze on God, 
but that which is needful to bring heart to this obedience we must do as i have already said quite simply without strain or study those who set out on this practice put me counsel to offer up in secret a few words such as my god i am wholly thine o god of love i love thee with all my heart lord make my heart even as thine or such other words as love prompts on the instant but take heed that your mind wanders not back to the world again keep it fixed on god alone so that thus subdued by the will it may be constrained to abide with god this practice of the presence of god is somewhat hard at the outset yet pursued faithfully it works imperceptibly within the soul most marvellous effects it draws down god's grace abundantly and leads the soul insensibly to the ever-present vision of god loving and beloved which is the most spiritual and the most real the most free and the most life-giving manner of prayer remember that to attain this state we must mortify the senses inasmuch as no soul which takes delight in earthly things can take full joy in the presence of god to be with him we must leave behind the creature end of section five Section 6 of the Spiritual Maxims of Brother Lawrence. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Of the Benefits of the Presence of God. The first benefit that the soul receives from the presence of God is that faith grows more alive and active in all events of life, particularly when we feel our need, since it obtains for us to succour of his grace when we are tempted or in every time of trial. Accustomed by this practice to take faith as guide, the soul by simple remembrance sees and feels god present and calls upon him freely and with such assurance of response receiving the supply of all its needs by faith it would seem the soul draws very near to the state of the blessed the higher it advances the more does living faith grow until at last so piercing does the eye of faith become that the soul can almost say faith is swallowed up in sight i see and i experience the practice of the presence of god strengthens us in hope our hope grows in proportion to our knowledge and in measure as our faith grows by this holy practice penetrates into the hidden mysteries of god in like measure it finds in him beauty beyond compare surpassing infinitely that of earth as also that of the most holy souls and angels our hope grows and waxes ever stronger sustained and enheartened by the fullness of the bliss which it aspires to and even already tastes in part hope breathes into the will a distrust of things seen for god's love is in very truth a consuming fire burning to ashes all that is contrary to his will the soul thus kindled cannot live save in the presence of god and this presence works within the heart a consecrated zeal a holy ardour a violent passion to see this god known and loved and served and worshipped by all his creatures by the practice of the presence of god by steadfast gaze on him the soul comes to a knowledge of god full and deep and to an unclouded vision all its life is passed in increasing acts of love and worship of contrition and of simple trust of praise and prayer and service at times indeed life seems to be but one long unbroken practice of his divine presence i know that they are not many who reach this state 
it is a grace that god bestows and on very few chosen souls for this unclouded vision is a gift from his all-bounteous hand yet for the consolation of those of such would fain embrace his holy practice let me say that god seldom denies this gift to those who earnestly desire it and if he does withhold this crowning mercy be well assured that by the practice of the presence of god with and of his sufficient grace the soul can attain to a state which approaches very nearly the unclouded vision this is the final text in this series end of the spiritual maxims of brother lawrence